Welcome back everybody to our Mass Timber Office Forum. My name is Matt Holman and I'm a partner at g and working within our project management division. Our agenda today, I'll give you, I'll shortly give you a brief overview of where we are with our series of forum sessions. I'll then hand over to Oliver Booth, another partner working in our cost management division to, to introduce you to our panelists. I'll then explain the structure of today's session. We'll then start our Q&A session with our panelists. As with previous sessions, we've um, our poll questions to make sure you're all awake. And please don't forget to use the chat function to ask questions. We'll try and answer as many questions as we can as we go through or at the end of the session or failing all of that as part of our summary report in the usual way. Lastly, I'll be introducing you um, to our next panel before I close the session. So firstly, we thought it'd be helpful to remind you of where we are uh, currently and also where we've been. So you can see where we are on the screen now um, and where we've got some remaining um, um, panels in the series. So over to Ollie for our panel introductions. Ollie. Thanks, Matt, and Happy New Year to everyone and a warm welcome to all for the next in our Mass Timber Commercial Office Forum series, which is on capacity and the supply chain. So as Matt's just said, uh, so far we've covered insurance, fire, sustainability, best practice during construction, cost program and procurement in the last session. And today we will hear from Europe's largest suppliers and manufacturers in the form of Binderholz, KLH, Hashlacker and Stororenzo. We will also hear from leading subcontractors and supply chain partners in BKS, HES, Hybrid Structures and KLH UK. All of whom have operated as subcontractors in the UK for many years and may already be engaged on your projects or will be in the near future. And so to the panel today, these individuals and their organizations have a wealth of experience operating across the UK and collectively they are responsible for completing the design, engineering, manufacture, transport and installation of many mass timber and hybrid buildings. Today they will give us a rare insight into their view as the, as the supply chain, one of the most critical elements in procuring uh, in the procurement of mass timber and hybrid commercial offices. Firstly we've got Mark Perridge, he is the Regional Sales Director for Hashlacker UK and Hess Timber. Mark has 33 years in the timber engineering industry, 20 years in glue lamb and CLT uh, specifically, and five years working for Hashlacker Group. Hess are part of Hashlacker Group and have the expertise to supply and install their own glue lamb, CLT and LVL, as well as many other timber systems. Hess are factories from all, all across Europe, predominantly in Austria and Germany, as well as factories in Slovenia and Russia. They have 1700 staff and an annual capacity to deliver 80,000 cubic meters of CLT, 450,000 cubic meters of glue lamb, on top of their other operations, as their sawmill produces some 880,000 cubic meters per year. Some of the iconic projects Hashlacker Hess have, involved, uh, have been involved in or are delivering at the moment include the T3 office in Atlanta for Heinz, Vitso factory in Leamington Spa, Sestafi 22 in, uh, office in Switzerland, Hoho in Austria, and Lendlease's International House office building in Sydney, to name just a few. Hess also providing the largest timber glazed facade, that's 2,500 cubic meters of timber, on Google Office in King's Cross, which also uses a coir. As mentioned previously on previous sessions, we are seeing a trend in projects in considering timber glazed facade systems on projects. Next to Nick Clark, he is the Managing Director of KLH UK. Nick has worked in the construction industry for over 30 years, working for a number of main contractors, mainly in the commercial role. Nick moved to KLH in 2012 to take over the UK operations and support KLH Group in promoting the use of CLT globally. This has seen him travel to the US, Canada, New Zealand, and recently South America. Nick has been the board director of the Structural Timber Association, known as the STA, since 2013. At the beginning of 2021, has taken over the prestigious uh, point as chairman for a two-year term. KLH UK have delivered circa 300 buildings over 15 years across all sectors. They are the UK subsidiary of KLH Massive Holtz, who have two manufacturing facilities, both located in Austria. The parent company began trading in 1999 and deliver CLT globally, supplying over 30,000 projects a day. And next to Greg Cooper, he is the managing director of, William, of Hybrid Structures William Hare. Greg joined William Hare Group in 2017 to lead a specialist mixed material division within the group as the group saw the growth potential of mass timber and hybrid structures. William Hare have a UK turnover of over 150 million per annum, specialising in building structures. Greg has extensive experience delivering solid timber and hybrid projects of varying scale across central London and the rest of the UK. Greg has many years of technical knowledge and experience in mass timber and hybrid structures. 
and he sits on the Trada Advisory Committee that has taken an active and has taken an active role in influencing the improvements and standards, notably the Natural Structural Timber Specification, Trada CLT Handbook, and the durability of cross laminated timber by the Structural Timber Association. Next to Andrew Goodwin, he is the Managing Director of BNK Structures, and he has 40 years of experience within the construction industry. The last 18 years within BNK Structures, joining as commercial manager in 2003 and promoted to managing director in 2016. The BKS timber business was established in 2006 as a trading division of BNK Steelwork Fabrications. However, such was the popularity and demand for timber structures that the timber and steel divisions were merged into what we now know as BK Structures. Over the last 15 years, BK Structures have grown to become one of the largest timber engineering specialists within the UK. CLT by demand is the most popular and exciting project in BNK's extensive portfolio. However, they are not CLT purists alone. BNK's business model focuses on hybrid construction solutions, including glue lamp steel, structural wall and roof cassettes. BKS have been instrumental in the development and growth of the timber market within the UK, and in order to meet the ever increasing demands of the growing market. Gareth Mason, he is the sales director of Western Europe Building Solutions for Store Enzo. In 2015, Gareth joined Stora as the UK Business Development Manager and was responsible for increasing specification of CLT in the UK and Ireland before progressing to Western Europe Sales Director in 2019. Working with his team, their aim is to continue to grow the already flourishing mass timber uh, business. They have supplied the materials for some of the most notable and award-winning mass timber buildings in the world, but they work on projects of all sizes. Gareth has been involved in many large-scale timber project, uh, projects internationally, and is currently involved in development of market for modular CLT and laminated veneer lumber in all markets. And finally, but by no means least, we welcome Mark Wayne Probert, who is the head of sales for Binderholtz UK Limited. Wayne is head of sales for Binderholtz Group for the UK and Irish markets. Wayne joined the Binderholtz Group in 2016 after many successful years with another major importer and distributor, using his knowledge and contacts with the industry to ensure Binderholtz develops its UK activities in all product sectors including CLT, glue, lamb and sawn products, increasing board brand awareness and continued growth for the Binderholtz Group. Wayne is also chairman of the WTTA Association and a director of the Timber Trade Association. Wayne was directly involved in the su and supplied cross-laminated cross timber to Bridgeport House, the first eight-storey building with CLT in Hackney, London. Wayne was also instrumental in winning the supply of CLT to Dock Square Library, a lend lease project in Melbourne, Australia, along with other successful projects, including Cobalt Place, Battersea, and other large residential development using CLT. In a few moments, Matt will introduce us to a video which demonstrates the scale and precision engineering process of manufacturing, manufacturing sawn timber for mass timber production in this well-established and flourishing industry. As always, the GNT team would just like to thank all of our panelists for giving us their time in contributing to today's forum and giving us this important insight from their perspective on mass timber and hybrid construction in commercial offices. Matt, over to you. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, okay, given today's session is all about capacity and supply chain, we've structured the sessions in order, in order that they're shown on the screen uh, to cover the topic from cradle to grave, or to put it another way, from sapling to reincarnation. Um, as Ollie mentioned just now, we thought we'd start with a, a short video. We, the main reason for this is to give you an example of the process, but moreover, just to reinforce to you all that this is this is big, big, big business, um, and it's, it's really worth a watch.
purpose of doing that, Laura. Okay, right. So, um, Ollie, to make sure everyone's awake, uh, let's have our first poll question, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Okay, shortly on your screens, you'll be seeing the question. So the question is, in your experience, have you engaged with subcontractors, suppliers during the early stages? So that would be the REBA stages one to three of a project before. And this is a simple yes or no answer, please. So we'll give you about 30 seconds or so just to answer that and, and, and we'll see the results shortly. Drum roll. And a whopping 95% of you said yes. So that, that's interesting to see that you engage early, which is really positive to see. Great. Thanks, man. Thanks for that. Right, straight into the questions then. So um, first question for Nick and Gareth. For our audience, can you summarise the various mass timber technologies such as CLT, glue lamb and LVL, just to make sure everyone's on a level playing field before we start? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, let's start with glue lamb. Um, glue lamb is um, a layered um, beam and column system where all of the grain direction runs in the same direction but it's the buildup of uh, layers of uh, timber board, um, typically using uh, a spruce as a, as a species and typically a C24 grade timber. Um, moving on to cross laminated timber and obviously CLT as it's abbreviated to, I think the video there showed it quite nicely, but it's the buildup of layers of, of timber on a panel, which is typically about 16 meters long, three meters wide. The, um, each layer is perpendicular to the layer above and beneath, and there's a glue line between each layer. It then goes into a press um, while the glue's set um, and then forms uh, what we call a mother panel. And then all of the individual panels are then cut from that mother panel for the uh, actual wall, floor and roof panels that you see typically turn up on site. Um, it comes as different visual grades as well, so you can expose the timber architecturally if that's what you want to do. So typically the manufacturers offer three grades of, of surface finish, um, a non-visual grade, which is what it says, it should be covered with plasterboard, and then a, an industrial visual and a, and a more sort of domestic visual grade. Um, again, typically the material that we use is spruce, um, but other, other materials are available um, if architecturally required and then Gaz is uh, sorry Gareth is going to answer our LVL question sorry Gaz. <laughs> uh, sorry no worries and uh, yeah LVL uh, stands for laminated veneered lumber um, it's very similar to glue lamb and CLT in the sense that it's layers of timber that are glue laminated together um, a key difference with laminated veneered lumber is that the layers are very thin they're three millimeter thick veneers so uh, the layers are much thinner um, but there's a lot more of them. Um, it's an incredibly strong product. Uh, in fact, in, if, with its strength versus weight ratio, it outperforms steel. So we're talking about really strong timber elements that are also very, very lightweight. Um, it's primarily used for beams uh, and columns in buildings, for large spanning uh, floor and roof elements like floor and roof cassettes. Um, it can be in beam or sheet form. Uh, it can be very large format, up to 24 metres long, three metres wide. So um, essentially, I think CLT, glue lamb, LVL, um, they all have varied um, uh, different characteristics. Uh, but what is very common across all of them is that they're incredibly strong, highly engineered timber products that can be pre-manufactured and pre-produced for construction building sites and building elements. Nick Gareth, thanks. That's a good summary. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, what is the scale and capacity of the mass timber industry that supplies the UK construction industry? If we could bring Mark uh, and Gareth and Wayne into that question. So who wants to take first? Oh, I'm going to start. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, we estimate the capacity of uh, the CLT market into the UK to be about, no, in, in Europe to be 1.25 million cubic metres. Um, and glue lamb is about 3 million cubic metres. Um, but interestingly, in 2015, um, the capacity for CLT was 600,000 cubic metres. And, uh, and the prediction at that time was that by 2020, we would have a capacity of 800,000 cubic metres. And we are starting 2021 with a 50% increase on that 2015 prediction. Um, 
Glue Lamb, on the other hand, has been around for many, many years, and that has already established itself as a building material across Europe, a standard building material. And it's due to this that the capacity is currently much higher. Great. Um, Gareth, do you want to come um, in? No, I, I carry on, actually. Sorry. I didn't realize. Um, the percentage of the capacity for the, the supplying in the UK market, um, um, there are no official figures for the um, UK market, but we gathered our thoughts and we think that 50,000 cubic metres of CLT um, is being currently delivered 2020 into, into the UK, which only equates to 4% of the current capacity. Um, and, in, and for glue lamb, we think it's about 35,000 cubic metres, and that would equate to just over 1% uh, of the current capacity. Um, uh, and to put that into a context of a building for everybody, um, if we take a three bedroom um, semi or terraced house in the UK built by Bovis Homes or somebody, that would equate to just 36 cubic metres for the entire substructure, that includes the roof, floors and walls. Um, looking at something bigger, um, say uh, an 80 bed student accommodation block, which we'd all know what it looks like, um, that would equate to 650 cubic metres of um, uh, CRT and glue lamp. Um, getting a bit bigger, we went to an office building, um, multi-storey office building, 2,500 square metre floor area, um, walls, um, internal walls, floors, post and beam construction, all in timber, um, maybe with a glazed facade. We would think that would be something like 1,500 cubic metres, just to scale it up, and then to really scale it up. The Ho Ho building in Vienna, which is 84 metres, 24 storey. Although it is a hybrid construction, it's still 75% timber, that building. And that has 4,600 cubic metres, and that only equates to 0.1% of the market capacity at the moment. Fantastic. That's really helpful, Mark. Thank you. Gareth. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously what's what's driving the driving force behind this uh, mass timber capacity is the forestry itself. Um, the majority of mass timber at the moment comes or is produced in, in Europe. Uh, there are some outside of Europe, but the majority of it is in Europe. So if we just look at, say, for instance, European forests uh, in 2019, there was an estimated 159 million hectares of forest land across uh, across all of Europe. Um, and within, contained within that forest is a growing stock, which is essentially the timber available for wood supply of about 27.1 billion metres cubed. So obviously speaking in metres cubed, it really <laughs> doesn't really make too much sense to, to a lot of other industries. So um, to, to put that into uh, sort of concept, as Mark was saying, the, we produce about 1.25 million cubic metres of mass timber. Uh, a year, so that's roughly around about 4% of Europe's uh, forestry stock. Um, and obviously that's just Europe, so when you take into account the forestry that's in places like Russia and Canada as well, um, there's a very strong uh, healthy forest stock uh, currently. Um, and it's actually increased since 1990. The, the forestry in Europe has increased by 10% since 1990, and that's because we're constantly planting uh, more trees than we're using. Um, and what's also really important about the forestry strength is the, the rate that it grows at. So uh, if we take the three biggest forests that are used for mass timber, so countries like Sweden, Finland and Austria, um, those three countries combined uh, make up about a third of Europe's forestry stock. And they have an average growth speed uh, of about 2.75 metres cubed of wood per second. So to put that again in terms of an office building, um, there was an office building recently built in central London, 5,000 metres squared of floor area, and the timber used in that building would be regrown within nine minutes in an Austrian forest. So by the time, you know, we've just finished this first question, um, we've, we've, you know, enough timber has been grown in Austria to build, build that building again. Um, and yeah, obviously growth speed is very much related to the the, the tree growth time, and typically spruce trees take about 70 years to reach maturity. Um, and uh, unfortunately, actually, uh, when trees reach maturity, they actually begin to release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So where we find quite a sweet spot for harvesting our trees is between 50 and 70 years old. 
at this point that means they give a really good yield of timber um, it also means they've taken in a lot of carbon dioxide they've done their job in, in cleaning the atmosphere uh, and it also means they don't reach that point where they start to give carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere so um, that's obviously the biggest key thing about forestry management is uh, is how much uh, carbon the forest is sequestering how much we're cleaning the planet using trees and in say for instance in one cubic meter of CLT there's typically 762 kilograms of carbon stored in that cubic meter and again putting it back into terms of a building um, in an office building eight stories 5,000 square meters that's around about a thousand tons of CO2 taken out of the atmosphere. Wow that's great um, so how much of the tree is used in a mass timber product? Uh, Mark, that's me, yeah. um, the, the whole of the log is is used um, into different parts, but it, it's broken down into the following. 40% um, typically is used for the mass timber industry, um, CLT and glue lamp. Um, then we have a sort of another 25% which is used, as you saw in the video, the sideboards coming off and for battens and pallets and that sort of smaller material. Um, then, then a big chunk of that then goes to paper and pulp. And the balance, the balance is then pellets and into biomass. The whole tree is used and nothing is wasted on it. Great. Wayne, just in terms of um, uh, certification and the like, can you just take us through that, that process? Wayne, you're on mute, I think. Wayne, you're still on mute, mate. No, he's on mute. Uh, Wayne, you're, you're muted. Sorry. That's it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, basically there's there's two schemes, PFC and FSC, uh, both global forest management certificate schemes, um, both recognized around the world. Um, they are different, um, but there's more similarities uh, than not. And both parties use a third party certificated bodies. Um, FSC was established in 1990. Uh, with the support of Greenpeace, uh, Friends of the Earth, and WWF. And then PFC came later in about 1999. And the reason for that is that the FSC scheme mainly um, was developed for um, tropical forests. And when the Europeans understood that certification was so important, um, for instance, in Finland, um, you have over about 350,000 different owners of the forest. Um, so that scheme didn't really fit into the European type of forest, um, unlike the, the um, tropical forest. So that's when PFC came, came along and developed their system, um, which, which both schemes um, promote uh, sustainability, protecting old forests, because that's very important, um, respecting the rights of the forestry workers and communities and and also conserving the forest and the for future generations and as uh, Gareth said you know to make sure that the forest grow more than is actually used um, the, the the key about the PFC side is that um, PFC was established in, in Luxembourg um, because of the the small forestry owners mainly from France, Austria, Germany, and Finland. And then the FSE was, was developed uh, predominantly in Mexico, as I said, by Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. Um, all the CLT, I would say, and the cross lamb that comes into the UK and across the world and Europe is predominantly from PFC forests. Um, you can obviously have FSE certification, but you're borrowing Peter to pay Paul. So, you, so global uh, manufacturers of product are using their FSC and PFC and, and use of the volume of wood to, to transfer volume and certification, which is a little bit um, uh, unreasonable. So basically, to, to um, and both schemes are supported by government. So um, government's uh, procurement policy allows you to buy PFC and FSC, and, and leaving that open um, uh, reduces the cost because if you specify uh, FSC or PFC, 
that um, incurs uh, costs. Because that, as I said, when it comes to PFC, most of the forests around the manufacturers mills uh, in Austria and Germany are PFC certified. There are, are more information about the two sources of schemes and I'll forward that uh, uh, so you can, uh, if, you want, if you want that requested, I can forward that on, which gives far more detail um, on both schemes. Thank you. Great. And then a question for, for you as well, just in, just in terms of the growth um, and uh, what, what is the sort of growth expected over the next five to 10 years? And is there enough forestry to meet the demand, uh, et cetera? Just, just a brief answer on that one, if you may. The total, should I take that one? Yeah, go for it, Wayne. Yeah. Um, capacity is just not a problem. Um, as, it, as Gareth said earlier on, that it's taken us about 20 years to get to 1 million cubic metres of cross-laminated timber. In less than two years, um, the manufacturers in Europe will increase their productivity to 2 million cubic metres. And in the UK, we don't take less, uh, we, we, we don't take less than 2%. The global, uh, sorry, the UK uh, imported volume of total of, of timber product is 17.2 million cubic meters. We are one of the biggest importers of timber products, um, which is about 3.4% of the European capacity. That's excluding Russia um, and uh, other, other forests from the US. So it's quite a small market compared to the global market of timber. Great, That's th thanks for that, Wayne, it's brilliant. Uh, Mark, just a quick one for you, just one for me, really. Um, how long does it typically take from a tree being felled to being used in, used in a mass timber product? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, well, as you saw in the video at the beginning, which was really informative, you can see the, the, the process. Um, basically, from the tree being felled to being cut in the sawmill to being kiln dried, then into the, the factories to be uh, made into the CLT panels, cut, um, shaped, um, windows cut out, um, painted, stained, windows added, um, whatever's needed to being on a lorry to be delivered to the um, job site would be roughly four weeks in a general pra practice. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Mm. Let's bring Greg in. Hi, Greg. Um, Greg, what's the best RIBA stage to get yourselves on board and start manufacturing the products? Um, Raw, everybody's always going to say as early as possible, but I really do believe with timber, stage two or stage three is the key where you can have the most influence over the design. And the reason for that is timber is such a different material to every other construction material out there that you really need specialist advice in terms of how it's naturally going to behave. Because a lot of the processes we've spoken about already is the fact it's a natural grown material that is going to move and change over time and having that specialist advice on durability, moisture content, etc., is absolutely key to getting the detailing correct. So, so you find in your having more direct orders with clients in, in the first instance than with main contractors? We, we are getting on both sides, yes. Okay, cool. Um, let's bring Andrew in as well. So Andrew, how involved at a design stage are you getting? You're on mute, Andrew. It. Just take yourself off mute. You off mute? Bottom left, Andrew. No, I've got it. It's not bottom left. It's top right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, as as Greg's uh, as Greg's alluded to, uh, I think um, the earlier we're involved, the, the better. We, we we certainly, from BKS perspective, over the last three to five years, I would say that vast majority of our schemes early, early doors we were involved too late reba stage four um which caused uh, for ourselves um more problems in terms of um uh, site logistics you know manufacturing you know uh, set out of the building and so forth so what we're finding now is i could say that probably um above 50 percent of our schemes are we're in, involved at pcsa stage at reba stage two um um, which for us is ideal because we believe that, that, that to get involved and to talk about, you know, if you like the design of the building as a holistic model, you know, as opposed to just talk about it, you know, in terms of a, a product. And 
we're finding that whilst consultants are, are, are very well informed, you know, which which we like, you know, and and, and you know, there's been more introduction of um, CLT, glulam, hybrid structures, and so forth. As Greg said, the specialist knowledge lies with us. So that involvement at Reba Stage Two and under a PCSA works better, you know, um, and it leads to a more economic design. It protects the product going forward. Uh, we also bring into, you know, into into full focus buyer strategies, durability, the insurers. You know, if I could just, you know, I mean, that is so important. You know, the amount of times we used to sit there and we'd say right you know have you got an insurer no we haven't we're not at that stage yet you are at that stage actually you know and and in in fairness in a lot of the schemes that we've been involved in recently um we have had the insurers at the table and that's vitally important because what we're seeing is is that insurers you know they want to be able to insure they want to have the assurances and the, and, and the certainty that, that the product is going to work and that the building itself is going to um, you know, work within its design life and so forth, and during the construction phase, all works. All this is, a, you know, is is uh, pivotal to an early engagement. This 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 will ultimately protect, you know, if you like, the building owners, the developers, the investors going forward. So yeah, you know, we, we you know, we we you know we will push that model early engagement with every client we work for, and it does bring about. I will say this, just one final thing. It does bring about commercial savings, in my opinion. You know, so you get commercial betterment from that. Thanks, Andrew. Nick, you've got a view on that? Well, I completely concur um, with uh, with Andy and Greg there. I mean, but then notwithstanding that, we've been involved in a project that when it was um, in design, it was back in what we, was stage D, maybe stage D+. Plus. Um, and the contractor had a problem with their program and needed to change horses at the last minute, as it were. And we were able to um, switch from a um, in situ reinforced concrete design to a cross laminated timber design um, and still get to site and beat the completion date that the contractor had for his concrete frame. So it was all a little bit, you know, pee and panic, but it was it was achieved. Um, you know, it's all about attitudes of the team at that point. Um, and it was a very successful scheme. Um, and so not only did they change the superstructure, but the engineer was actually able to, to revisit the substructure design and hoik out a load of piles um, from the scheme as well. So there was a, not only a cost saving in the ground, but also a time saving as well. So whilst the advice would be, you know, get the specialists involved at the earliest possible stage, if you've got a desire to run an alternative option, um, then don't don't give up on it. Still, still ask the question because it still could be achieved. Great. Okay, I was, I'm going to um, move on a bit. So, um, thanks for that, Nick. Um, so, Greg and Andrew, I was going to talk about um, the manufacturing within the UK. Why there's no um, current UK manufacturing Brexit, etc. But we've had a good question come in from uh, John Curran. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for the question, John. And he'd asked, uh, after we passed through this initial period of post-Brexit agreement, as a consumer of timber, what logistical con considerations should be made to successfully import the product? So maybe we can weave that in, Greg and Andrew, to an answer relating to, you know, the general UK situation. Yeah. Yeah, do you want me to answer that, Greg? Yeah, yeah you yeah. can go first, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Uh, from a from an importing uh, perspective, uh, post Brexit, clearly there's more paperwork, and what we've done, you know, um, it's it's to, if you like, um, engage with obviously our clients, which is which is ultimately to discuss, you know, what possible, and it's not a delay. What what we need to do is consider it within the you know the um, within the build program of, of the schemes, and we're doing that now. So there may be slightly delays at port, there may be more paperwork, but I think in terms of um, actually impacting upon our, um, uh, you know, um, our ability to, to, to deliver it, it doesn't impact on, on it at all. It's just a matter of making due consideration for the, for the changes, uh, you know, you, within your construction program, you, and obviously design considerations as well, design leads and so forth. So on some of the schemes, we've engaged with our clients early doors and we've pushed, you know, key critical information earlier, 
you know, uh, in terms of site logist logistics and things like that, that doesn't really change. But I think in terms of um, any delays at the port are, are, are minimal. That's the way that's the way we see it, and that's the way it's been impacted at, at the moment. So we don't see that. You know, so I don't think that's going to be a, a massive, um, um, you know, impact. Um, you know, as, as part of the post Brexit negotiation or the deal that, that that's been put through. To hear, Greg, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, initially at the moment we're the twelfth of January, so we are starting to see little things, small delays at ports, as Andy said, up to a day is what we found. But as Andy says, we're able to manage that out in the programme by bringing deliveries in slightly earlier and managing it out as the, the good job that we, we all do. The other thing to bear in mind as we move through a post-Brexit situation is the technical support that CE marks. We need to make sure the suppliers and everybody understands these UK CE marks and uh, we're able to get insurance and uh, have the necessary uh, technical support moving forward as well. And all, good, all the manufacturers are putting those processes in place to ensure we can build for it beyond 2022. Great, okay. Uh, can I just say a few words on, on imports? There's no tariff on these timber products. Um, so Glulam, uh, all standard timber products, and including CLT, there's, there's no tariff. Um, we've already started putting lorries across the border um, and the, the main bottleneck is, is obviously Dover, uh, but very little of our products come through Dover. They come through other ports, so there, there's not so much delay there. And for the next six months, um, the customs agency is, is sort of waiving um, products like timber, which, which have no risk. Um, through the border. Um, Greg picked up a, a good point that C marking will eventually be phased out in the UK because the UK want their own standard. Um, so there, there is new legislation coming forward on that. So you need to be aware of that as well. Um, but as, as um, Andy said, uh, it's just a lot more paperwork. Wayne, that's really helpful. Thanks for that. Um, we're, we're running slightly behind where I wanted to be, so I'm just going to combine uh, a couple of questions, mainly relating to uh, site logistics approach when constructing the buildings and whether there's any particular implications when um, constructing high-rise uh, mass timber buildings. So, Greg, Andrew, Nick, Mark, maybe um, you want to just relay your thoughts on logistics and, and, and the like? Yeah, sure. I'll just jump in there, Matt. Um, one of the key things to consider around CLT is uh, do a site logistics check, make sure that you can get your crane and your lorries to site. That's pretty critical. Um, not always the case. If you've got a restriction on your delivery, um, which is going to restrict the type of lorry that can be brought to site, that will influence the design. Um, so that needs to be considered at the very early stage. Um, but you must consider that using an off-site manufactured product, everything is pretty much planned and agreed before the product is manufactured. So it needs to run um, according to the plan when it gets to site. So that early logistics check is really vital. And then from a safety point of view, please consider your, your fire risk assessments and your offsite fire risk assessments as well. They need to be in place um, when the timber starts so that any mitigation can be implemented um, at, the, at the appropriate point. So if, jump in anyone else. Um, that wants to contribute I, to that? I was going to say, we need to make sure, I think the biggest key is, is what we're finding is, uh, we're defining as end-to-end -end strategies. And what we mean by that is, as Nick says, it's important that we consider fire during construction. And the one thing we want to do with fire during construction is build compartments and keep in a container. However, that leads to other issues that I know uh, can lead to on site, which is water. So you want to stop one thing, but you want to get the other one away. And we have to make sure we have end-to-end -end and a robust strategies from start to completion. And only through engagement in the RIB stages and with the main contractor on site are we able to deal with all of them. Because sometimes the measures we put in place for fire have a knock-on effect with the water strategy. And it's just making sure that there's a fully joined up approach that allows us to um, deal with all the problems that we face on site. And that's not to say that no problem can be overcome. It just needs 
thinking about and planning in advance and they can all be overcome and they're all built well and it, like i say it's just having those open conversations early doors great and just bringing in andrew on this andrew there's often um we're often asked questions about the durability of mass timber um how do you think that compares to other systems to be, to be honest you, you you have to uh, you have to look at uh, clt in terms of um exactly what the guys have just said there the, di the difficulties come with with durability is when the product is ignored in terms of you know it's treated as any other product and it shouldn't be um it, it, it isn't a problem you know if we've got as greg said you know an end-to-end -end, you know sort of approach in terms of durability where we engage with people early early doors and the design is right you know it, it, there's, a, there's a functionality of the reba stages which, which means that, that you have to get the design right you know and you know the biggest issues that, that can that, that, that can um, emanate in, in terms of durability emanate from the design stages of, of, of the build but equally you know it, it's fair to say that i would say in the last two years you know the 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 development, you know, especially with the manufacturers as well, you know, they, 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 you know, they're now introducing, you know, um, you know, water control membranes that, that that are being introduced onto CLT that are factory applied. You know, the moisture control procedures that we all operate um, now that the, the KLH, you know, hybrid structures, you know, um, ourselves and Hess will all operate now, will protect both, you know, the product ourselves, uh, the client, um, and that and that. Um, uh, that, if you like, that uh, that design life of, the, uh, of that product. So, I wouldn't run scared of anything on CLT. If if you've got the right specialist on board, you uh, you you engage, uh, you, you know, in terms of the durability, the very early stages. And the important thing is that after we walk off site, that there is a moisture control plan in place with the main contractor, and all of us, we you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll sit there, you know during the REBA stages to ensure that there's a robust plan in place after we've left. You know, so it, there is nothing to be, you know, there's nothing to be concerned about. In fact, in fact, the, you know, the, the, there's, the, there is greater control the earlier we're involved. And, you know, I don't see that as an issue, major issue going forward. That's a recurring theme, really, competency and experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Gareth, just a quick, a couple of quick fire questions, if I may. Um, 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 what do you think the audience should know about uh, timber when it comes to dealing with its end of life? Um, I mean, end of life is a, is a really important topic, especially when it comes to LCAs, uh, life cycle assessments. So it's uh, one of the key things is for um, architects and, and designers to understand what the carbon impact of the building is across its whole life. And that includes demolition of the building. Um, all major mass timber manufacturers have a thing called an EPD, which is an environmental product declaration. And in that EPD, it gives values for the different end of life scenarios that are used in these LCA calculations. Um, and I understand we're a bit tight on time, Matt. So maybe if I just pick out a couple of the key ones, uh, there's four. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, their reuse, recycling, incineration and landfill. Um, if we take a look at reuse, uh, that's obviously when the building's demolished is taking the timber that's in that building in, and using it as like a reclaimed timber. And we're actually doing a study with uh, the CITB in France at the moment to look at average panel sizes and thicknesses and dimensions, percentage of penetrations, so we can have a good understanding of, you know, what's, what the average uh, waste timber from a demolition can be reused for. Um, but particular for reuse, reuse, when we look at things like modular and volumetric construction, so this is where buildings are made in, connected in modules together on site, technically you could reuse the whole building because you could take that building apart, move it 100 miles down the road, rebuild it again, reclad it, and you've essentially reused the entire building again. And of course these buildings can last um, you know, centuries as long as they're kept in service class one or two um, environments. So there's no reason why these can't be reused. And another big one is recycling. Uh, obviously, these panels can be chipped down and they can put into be put into new products like chipboard. Um, but really interestingly, this year, uh, Storians have created a, a new product called CLT Rex. And this is actually completely recycling CLT panels. So this is where we take old CLT panels 
Um, we saw them into thin strips, 40, 50 millimeter strips to form new lamellas. And then we use those lamellas of CLT to create new CLT panels. Um, it's got an ETA and it's been fully tested. And what we found was that this recycled CLT has exactly the same structural capacity as brand new CLT. The only difference being that it has a lower modulus of elasticity. Um, so really there's this, you know, there's this method of being able to completely recycle old CLT into new CLT panels. So uh, there are definite ways you can recycle and reuse these buildings at end of life. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Ollie, uh, you've been quiet for a while, so let's have another poll question. Hey Matt, thanks. I'll make some noise. Um, right, so our next question. Uh, in your experience, uh, do the audience think that subcontractors have the capacity and expertise to enable your timber projects? And this is a one of three. Is it a yes, a no, or kind of nonchalant, non-applicable, you don't know. So if, if you just uh, click one of those, please, and we'll find out what the results are. Certainly demystifying a lot of uh, things that we've we've heard today from everybody on the panel, so it's, it's fantastic. Actually, whilst people are answering that, Greg, if you get ready, because I'm just going to ask you about, you know, a few myth busters, really. Uh, give, give us some answers to uh, questions you're commonly asked. So just wait for the answers to come up on the poll, and then uh, we'll get on with, with that. Okay, the answers are in, Matt. So uh, a whopping 79% of people said yes, they, they do feel that, that, that in their experience that the subcontractors have capacity and expertise to enable their timber projects. Only 10% said no, and 10% said non-applicable. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so um, Greg, on that question then, so just some of the common common myths there are, is there anything out there that you, you're commonly getting asked and you just think, actually, this is a good forum to just um, put it put it straight now? I think we've been through a lot today, if I'm honest, uh, but I think to top and tail a few more, can you fix m &E to CLT? Yes, you can. It's quite easy to screw through and to hold it. You do have to consider the fire strategy as part of the centre of the screws, etc. but it's perfectly possible to be fixed to. Can you design it to take plant loading or heavy loading or uh, a sports hull? Yes, you can. And there's a lot of experience out there and a lot of precedence there that shows it can be done. It's part of the main design of the structure. Do we understand the performance? How does it move? How does it, how does the moisture content change? Is the building going to start shrinking and swelling? We know how the building is going to behave and you have to do a movement and moisture content analysis of the structure. But all this behavior is known. We understand how it's going to behave and we factor that into account with the advice and the main design that is done by the structural engineer. But nothing is, a, nothing is not overcomable by thinking about the material in its true nature. And as a lot of people have said, treating it as, as the product it actually is. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, Ollie, let's uh, have our final poll question, because I think this one's going to be an interesting one, particularly for the summary report at the end. So. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. OK, so final poll for today, please. Uh, in your opinion, what do you consider to be the biggest constraint to the delivery of the construction phase for timber buildings? Is it capacity of supply, expertise, subcontractor resource, site logistics so there's one of four answers there and, and just to say obviously that there will be a white paper at the end of the whole series so if we've missed one there that you think is important do email us let us know and we, we'll try and address it later on in the series the answers on that i'm gonna um after this go uh, there's a live question that i'm keen to ask um so i'll i'll go straight to a live question again it's from john curran so thanks john you're busy this morning thank you for that Answers in? Answers coming through now. So 0% uh, of the audience said capacity of supply. 53% um, said expertise, which is interesting. 22% said subcontractor resource and 25% said site logistics. So expertise seems to be the thing that uh, the audience uh, are more concerned about. Great. Thanks, everyone. OK, I've got a, uh, the, the, the question from John that I wanted to ask was, how do you manage the benefit of market competition where, with desire to bring suppliers on board early? How far are you willing to go at no cost with a design team without a firm commitment? Interesting one. It's probably more directed towards, um, towards Greg and Andrew and Nick, I guess. But um, who wants to take that one? Um, I don't mind having a run at that. Um, thanks for that, John. 
Um, yeah, the, the, the PCSA process that uh, Andy mentioned earlier, um, yeah, is becoming more common. Um, so there's a fee there for your specialist to get on board and produce a design. Um, you'll, you'll then own that design. So effectively, you could take that design to market and market test it. Um, that's completely possible. Um, with regards as to what we're prepared to do speculatively, um, the, there's always a degree of, of speculation required in terms of work. So we'll provide, you know, models and indicative sizes, indicative budgets um, and quotations. But yeah, they are indicative. You wouldn't want to build to them, but they'll give you a fair idea of what you're going to be getting. Um, maybe give you an idea about your setting out, etc. I think that's that's for me, Andy or Greg, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I think that that we certainly from from our perspective, um, obviously the PCSA route is, is the right way to go. But before we can get to that stage, I think where John's possibly coming from is they may have a scheme and they may say, well, you know, is this product, you know, or, you know, is this design, you know, can we, is there is there a design out there that's suitable for what I'm looking for? And, and as Nick would say, we would we would offer that initial advice and it would be limited but it, it, would, it would definitely be sound advice in terms of you know the, the direction of travel which you could go um i think um any of us you know obviously in wanting to promote crt and and, and, and glue and hybrid structures would want to um, offer that 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 sound advice and judgment anyway going forward but clearly i, I think there's a limit to what you can do within a, a period of time and I think that you know we've all learned as businesses that um, what well, we have to our cost at times where we've offered more detailed information gone that that stage further but as a business model that's not viable for ourselves so so yeah I think I think it, it's good practice for us to, to offer that advice equally you know we would offer sound advice not just on the design but but also uh, durability fire strategies uh, and and so forth you know so there's a lot more that goes with with that early advice but the detailed uh, design that we would be looking at engagement within the pcsa that's that's the route that, that we, we would ultimately want to go and there's, a, there's another question actually it's coming from um, nick jackson which i want to ask not least because he's a good mate um uh, what are the key design specification factors that impact on cost at manufacturing stage i don't know who wants to pick that up but that's a Pretty good question. It relates pretty much. Um, I can I can pick yeah. that up. I mean, at, at manufacturing sta stages, um, probably the biggest cost comes from uh, wastage and efficient nesting uh, and and panel splitting. So mass timber. If we if we talk very specifically about CLT, it applies to the number. It applies to a certain element of glue lamb and LVL as well, but. The CLT, for instance, um, it's made in very large uh, master panels first uh, by certain to certain set dimensions, and then all the other panels are cut from inside that. And what's incredibly important is using an experienced designer um, to split the, the building efficiently, because those final panels should be split as close to these master panel or chargeable width sizes as possible. Um, because that's the way you get your wastage down. Um, you can see quite a big difference in wastage between different types of buildings, but also different experience levels of designs. So I would say manufacturing wise, it's understanding the transport and logistics costs. It's understanding wastage and panel design. Um, and it's understanding also your choice of, of panel type. So understanding how to optimize different types of panels together. Um, and that really comes from the work of our partners um, and, and companies like BKS and Urban and Hybrid and Hess. Um, uh, yeah, it, it really starts at design uh, and it has to run all the way from design to manufacture. Great, Wayne, did you want to add anything to that, Wayne? Yeah, the, the two, two points really. Um, Everything that uh, Gareth has said is, is totally correct. Um, the design is also for delivery to site. And, you know, we're not going to change the size of uh, an articulated lorry. So it's 13 and a half metres long and 2.95 metres uh, wide to get the, the, the size of panel um, optimally to site. Um, so just think of a, of a lorry. What can you get on a lorry? Um, and, and also, uh, we, we produce a, a panel which is uh, BBS125, which is 1.25 metres wide. So that's a grid of 1.25. Uh, 
and and like the the large format w w which we all produce as well is if you work on on a small bbs125 it's it's a grid um it's not it's it's mainly used in floor decks uh, in the uk but in central europe is it's mainly used on on housing so there is a grid system and um and that's lower cost to use if you use a, a grid system but what i get most of the time is people not looking at our websites for this information um every manufacturer has got all this information on the website for standard sizing and the industry came together about 10 years ago to standardize the thicknesses nick clark will, will understand this and the lamella sizes so it's all now standardized whereas in the past uh, every manufacturer had its own thickness and the mail side, but standardization came in about 10 years ago. Great. Thanks, Wayne. So I guess a question to all of you um, to, 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 to wrap up in a way is um, how do you see mass timber changing in the next five years? Um, I don't know who wants to throw an answer into that. For that. I'm, getting, I'm getting more and more people contacting me from um, the development side. So, uh, for instance, a couple of months ago, I was approached by a hotel chain to say, how can we build more sustainable? Um, there is going to be more demand on timber products. Um, in the UK, through, um, through just the, the lockdown and the pandemic, uh, sales of timber um, within the UK has gone up by about 50%. B&Q, for instance, uh, their sales have gone up 50% uh, in the last 12 months. And, and there will be a pressure on, on timber, uh, timber as a uh, sustainable product because basically it, it is the most sustainable product in the construction armory uh, against uh, the products like steel and concrete. Um, but what we, we hopefully have explained to you today is that the forest industry is a, a very old industry. It's preparing a long time for this growth. There is far more growth in the forest than than building sites uh, that the UK can can build. Um, so uh, from from my point of view, is it's it's all achievable. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think what, what I've learned from today is the capacity is most certainly there. And anyone else got anything they just want to add before I start to wrap up? Uh, I don't. I don't mind going if if no one else minds. Um, I think in the from a manufacturing perspective, in the in the next five years, we're looking very closely at R and D. Uh, and innovation uh, we think there's probably going to be a much uh, quite a few changes in within five years in digitalization uh, the type of sensoring and monitoring and measurement uh, measuring of, of live building elements we can do i think there'll be greater advances in bim technology and the bim data a 7d bim that comes live from site um, i think there'll be advances in virtual reality and augmented reality and design tools in mass timber um, but also from a a physical sense, I think that we'll, we'll see an increase in um, being value added, being added to elements. So shifting more things off site at the moment, it's already really quick using mass timber components, but by adding more value uh, in the factory environment, claddings, uh, insulations, membranes, plaster boards, these kind of things, which has already been done, begun. It's already being done now, but, um, but I think we'll see more of that, more automization, uh, and more standardization of design in the future. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna have to wrap it up there, but thank you all panelists today. I really enjoyed that one. I, honestly, I think we could have gone for another couple of hours to be honest with you. Um, I've got, there's a number of questions I haven't asked, but we'll answer those in our summary report in the usual way. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Um, um, brilliant panel. Um, so coming up next, um, we've got uh, who's who from the engineering world, really. Uh, so we've got Structure, MEP and Acoustics in our engineering forum. So we've got um, the, the vast array of companies being represented there. Uh, Whitby Wood, Arup, Rambol, AKT, Hawley, uh, HTS and Elliot Wood. I mean, what a panel that is. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, that's it, really. I mean, the don't, don't forget to... Um, uh, shape our next session with any questions you may have um, the sessions are obviously for everyone here on, on on the forum so if you've got any questions you want to ask in advance of that that will help us shape the question so just email uh, masstimber at gardener.com and we will shape it from there but um, lastly thank again uh, to the panel uh, fantastic session um, and thank you all <laughs>